Um, I'm going to start off a little sobering about stats about golf. And we're ultimately going to ask our panel to help us think about how to apply four topics. Uh, aging baby boomers, millennials, women and families, and the degree of difficulty slash quality of our golf courses. How do we apply that to our clubs and the uniqueness of each one of our clubs as we continue to attract members, run profitable businesses, and ultimately enhance the game of golf by attracting people to our clubs? The stats, though, are quite sobering. The number of golfers in the United States has decreased for seven years in a row, and the game has lost nearly 500,000 golfers in 2011 and 2012. The game is down nearly 5 million golfers since 2004. Double-digit sales declines in golf equipment. For eight consecutive years, more golf courses have closed than opened. And in the Met area, from 2007 to 2013, 15 clubs and courses have either gone out of business or changed ownership and their management structure. The good news in the Met region is only four courses have closed. So if you listen to those stats, you would say, wow, the industry really has some challenges. And the reality is it does, only if we worry about it as it's going to come back and we're all going to be OK. And the reality is I don't think any of us sit here and say, it's just a cycle. It'll be back. It'll be OK. I think the reality is we've all probably done, as these gentlemen talked about this morning, when from 10 years ago, if you were on one of our boards, you didn't really have that much work to do, right? People were kind of lined up at the door. And in the last 10 years, that has obviously changed. So the challenges as a board and as a club is to figure out how to adapt to all of this. What are the new ideas? What are the new methods of play? What are the rules changes? And from jeans to larger cups to all things that we hear about, what should we be doing at our clubs? And again, I think it's around the uniqueness of your club and how you're going to be able to adapt. We have four panelists, one of which you've already heard this morning, and three I'd like to briefly introduce who are going to talk about these topics. The first is Bob Carney. He's a contributing editor for Golf Digest. He's been an integral part of their editorial and creative team for over 30 years. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan, studied journalism at Columbia. He has overseen GolfDigest.com and Golf World Magazine and served on the executive committee of Golf 2020 and is one of the great commentators of the game. Bob Carney. <laughs> With love and affection, I introduce Jay Matola, who's been the executive director of the MGA for the past, over the past 30 years. Jay is a graduate of Lafayette College and the Wharton School, and in his role, is leading the, MGA for the, leading the MGA for the past three decades, has worked closely with all of our clubs on a variety of issues, and has a great feel for the dynamics of golf in the Met area, as well as nationally. Jay Matola. <laughs> and finally, Susie Whaley. We're delighted to have Susie with us. She's one of the leading women players and teachers in the country. Susie won the Connecticut PGA Section Championship with both men and women competing together, and in 2003, this victory earned her a spot in the Greater Hartford Open, and she was the first woman to compete in a PGA Tour event in 58 years. She did that before Annika. She was an Olympic caliber skier before an injury slowed that pursuit. We are lucky that she turned her talents to golf. After graduating from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, she has, wi she has played on the PGA Tour and since then has been widely recognized as one of the top playing and teaching professionals in the country. She currently teaches at TPC River Highlands in Connecticut and is involved in numerous junior, first tee, and girl golf programs, girls golf programs. Susie, welcome. <laughs> Steve, we did your bio this morning, right? So yes, everybody knows who you yes, are. Yes, sir. Okay, so why don't we start with the topic on women and families. Um, growing the game, increasing participation, public and private golf, women present a lot of opportunities to our clubs, as do our families. Women are the fastest growing segment in golf. And I think we all know that the age of kind of the single breadwinner household has mostly gone away. So there's a lot of things to think about. How do we attract families to clubs? How do they have time to play together, eat together, relax together, and enjoy our clubs? And secondly, how do we make golf more accessible to women at each of our clubs, make it a more conducive learning environment? So Susie, I'd ask if maybe you start on this topic and we'll run through our panelists. Sure, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. All of you that are here today have already made the effort to get here, so I realize you're willing to make some of these changes. And I do believe we have some 
ideas amongst the four of us that perhaps can help you. Certainly they won't be for everybody, um, but what I share with you, I've seen across the country work uh, at private facilities like yours. And I think there's a few steps to take when you start really wanting to seek out more families and females at your properties and at your clubs. I think you need to ensure that you've done a complete facility audit, uh, walking through your facility uh, with a different lens, with a different gender lens, as soon as you arrive. You know, what happens when you arrive? What does it look like when you walk in the front door? What are the pictures on the walls? Are there pictures on the walls of women enjoying each other's company, playing golf? Or are there pictures on the wall only of trophies um, and of landscapes? Uh, women tend to seek out community. They want to be with people that are similar to them. They love sharing friendships. Uh, they like how golf makes them feel. And so if you really look at your facility and determine how, how are we making them feel while they're here, uh, what do we have for dining options? You know, women, four out of five households right now are dual income households. And typically, this is a stereotype, but typically the female also is responsible for the home life, for managing the house, taking care of all those things. So if you really look at your property, what services are you offering that she values? Because no longer is she coming just because you're fabulous. She's going to come there because you're giving her some value. You're giving her family value. And typically, the female in the household makes those influential decisions of where time is spent. So if you have dry cleaning, for instance, if you clean her car, if you offer grocery service, whether you put it in the trunk, if you have takeout menus on the golf cart, where she can order dinner and stay and play an extra nine holes? Do you have opportunities in the afternoons for her children to stay at the golf course without her and without her spouse, where they're supervised, monitored, and do you have the staff to do that? Are you offering junior programs that meet her needs after other sports and activities in the afternoons? I think if you really took a, a deep dive audit into what she values and to what you're offering, you will be amazed at how quickly you will get families and children to your property. Jay? Mike, I'd just like to follow up on a couple of things, and because I, I think, as Kurt mentioned, you know, getting women to play more golf, to get them engaged, it's a multiplier effect. You get the family involved, you get more activity, and it is a key to retention of membership. Again, much more difficult decision if both spouses are playing golf and engaged at the club, obviously. And I think when we look at statistics at the MGA, the number of spouses, women playing golf, it's been in that 28% range for the past 10 years. And I think with clubs can, in, in a business-like manner, focus how can we get that number to 35% or 40%. And, and don't just say, we have a nine-hole group, we have an 18-hole group, we encourage people to play. That's not going to get the women that are on the sidelines engaged. So I think you know, really focusing on those numbers and really trying in a, in a very you know, objective manner to say, hey, what is it going to take to get that number to increase? I just think the benefits for clubs are, are tremendous. Yeah, I would add as well in, in, in that facility audit, you know, what, what does the property look like on a staff perspective? Do you have females working on the property? Do you have females working in the golf shop? Do you have PGA professionals in the golf shop that can really encourage women to play the game? And you know, to Steve's point earlier, not all of us hit it 80 yards. There's a lot of us that hit it farther than that. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, there's women who can enjoy the game hitting it 80 yards. Um, you know, We have this stigma out there that you have to be great at the game to love it. That you have to be great at the game to enjoy it. You know, when you look at the ski industry, the ski industry never says you have to leave the green slope. The ski industry says, enjoy your time here. We love having you. Enjoy your family to be here. And ski the green all day. And come and have cocoa after. And, and it's, it's a great experience. But for some reason, we continue to tell people that, well, you've got to get better. You absolutely have to get better. Or you're not going to like the game. You're definitely not going to like it unless you're a blue slope or a black slope, for those of you that ski. And if we turned our, our mentality around, uh, to accepting not only women, but all people into our game, if we made it so that they can enjoy it on their terms and not on traditional golf terms, which I am a traditional golf professional, but we could still play the game with the same size cups we have now, get more people out playing more rounds, get people to play faster because they may be playing from a shorter yardage, 
and really have the opportunity to bring their families in and feel great about their experience. Bob, <clears throat> Bob that's a pretty good transition to your topic around the golf courses are run by the best players. Yeah. So it's a perfect transition to that topic. Yeah, I think, um, and it, it, it's sometimes true, even with the female members, um, the people who run the golf committees tend to be the better players. And that's sometimes true of the female members who are on the golf committee. They're the better players. They're the 18-holers, not the 9-holers. And, and my experience is that if you look to the members who are playing on Sunday afternoon with their spouse or with their kids, they'll tell you, they, they can show you, they'll play alternate shot, or they'll just see how many pars they can make. You know, they'll play five or six holes. They will do a lot of things that if you offered it to everybody and made, made it clear that that was okay, uh, you'd have a lot more people playing. I also think a simple, I think it was suggested before, but I'm not sure, the simple idea of saying we have X number of spouses in the club, male and female, who don't play. Let's have a clinic for them. Let's have a special day for people who don't play golf or people who don't play tennis and, and see if we can't get them involved. Um, I, I haven't seen that very often. Um, the, the tendency of good players is to want to challenge themselves more. And so we end up with tougher is better. We're, we're addicted to stroke play. We're addicted to fast greens. We're addicted to courses that are really difficult. And when you, when you buy into that, what does that say to the members who, who aren't such good players? Um, this is kind of a, a recent quote, but David Kidd, David McClay Kidd, who designed Band and Dunes, one of the most popular new golf courses out there. He's also um, uh, built a course called Gamble Sounds, which is one, one of the top new courses from Golf Digest. Here's what he said. He said, I'd gotten romanced by notions of defending par and resistance to scoring. So I built courses more difficult, I admit it. Those courses took some of the enjoyment out of the game. I wanted to put the idea of fun back into the game with this new course. Well, how do we kind of take that philosophy to our clubs? Where is the fun? Um, there's a couple of board members from Brooklawn here where I played for, what, 25 years. And the now most popular event of the year, number one is a scramble. Number two takes place in November. Go figure. Started with a few guys saying the day before Thanksgiving, we're going to play a scramble, put $20 in, there'll be prizes. It's now hard to get into. There are two groups on every hole. It's also a great recruiting tool for new members because when they come and play in that thing as a guest, uh, it's, it's so much fun. There's no grinding. It's just pure fun. And, and I think the more events like that, Stableford events, um, alternate shot, there are a lot of solutions, as Susie said, in the traditions of the game that can help us with the challenges we have now. I hope that each one of you is thinking a little bit about how does some of this apply uniquely to your club. There's so many different types of clubs in our area. So the ability to kind of take some of this and say, how can we apply it to our club, my friend's clubs, what really applies? Is there anybody here from Quaker Ridge at the moment? Beth, I didn't see Beth post. Um, I don't know if you know about this, but she talked at the last executive committee meeting about what sounds like a women's nine-holer or pre-nine-holer. They call it don't get left behind. I might get this a little wrong, but it was the kind of psychological play of, I don't really play yet, I'm a woman who wants to play, I'm scared to death of all the rules and everything else that goes on, so I'm, I'm not even sure I want to go play nine holes. And I think what they did at Quaker Ridge was turn it around and say, there are no rules, you don't have to be a nine holer, just come play with us and we'll have lunch or dinner or whatever we do and don't get left behind. And they took the approach not of excluding people, but including everybody and understand it's been very effective. And I think I described that correctly, but she told us all about it last meeting and I made sure I put it in our notes. Hey, Bob, can you continue for a minute as relates to, um, you're, you're implying a little bit of golf being a little out of touch and there's a generation that we are clearly out of touch with, which are the millennials. So 
Millennials, uh, I think from a Golf Digest survey, talked about golf is too expensive, it's too time consuming, it's too exclusive, it's too complicated, it's not diverse enough, and we 20 and 30 year olds don't really like it. So other than our children, who we've probably brought up in the sport, there's a real challenge here. Right, no, it's, um, it's very interesting and it's not all we think millennials are. They tend to be very visual, so they like apps, for example, like, like the MGA app. They tend to be very, very into technology. So the idea of you separating them from their phones kind of, it's not gonna happen. Um, they also are very musical. And the good news is, a hey, music is great. The bad news is they have a strong affinity for country and hip hop music, uh, for some of us anyway. Uh, but, but I was playing a stream song in Florida and I got, um, matched up with a young couple, both very good golfers, really good golfers. And after we got to know one another for a few holes, I noticed that they had their, their uh, phones out and were playing music. And they were playing it very quietly. And I said, you can play the music louder, that's okay. That's fun. So they started playing it louder and it was, it was you know, my morning jacket or something and I wanted to hear Van Morrison. So, we had a contest that if you won a hole, you got to pick the music for the next hole. So that, you know, we got to remember to be playful. When we did the survey of the millennials, the middle-aged guys, and the people over 55, and we had 25 reasons you might want to play golf, what the main reason, your number one reason, each one of them, each group said fun. And, you know, I noticed that there's a great quote from, from uh, Tom Watson who said, golf will grow as long as it's fun. I think he said that before the Ryder Cup. <laughs> uh, but we, we, you know, we tend to be very almost religious about our game. Um, I think Bruce McCall, the great uh, cartoonist and, and artist said, uh, not even Barbara Streisand celebrates herself as tirelessly as golf celebrates itself. So I think we have to be a little lighter to get these new uh, millennials. But they are, you know, they do aspire to belong to a club. More than half of them say they'd like to join a club. They don't have any problem with the, the dress code. They kind of like the idea of getting dressed up. Um, now the other side of that is how many have been to a top golf facility? Anybody? That you, you, I think if you're looking at the game as well as your club, it would be a good idea to put that on your to-do list because, and certainly check out the website for Top Golf. It is a sports bar where golf broke out, and and um, it is totally social. If you look at the website. It, it, you'd think you were on a dating site. Um, male, female, lots of fun. Corporations do outings there. Um, there are some serious golfers trying to, because the, the, the balls are, are, um, have chips in them, you can, you can actually create a score as you hit shots and people try to, uh, the equivalent of bowling a 300 game, the good golfers. But the fact is, it is, total fun, and it's the one business that I know in golf that's gone like this while, while those numbers that Mike talked about were going down. So the millennials aren't as different as we think, but they do really want to have fun, they want to have music, and they want their technology. Susie? I just want to add to that a little bit about millennials and, and females. If you think about digital components, I think many of us in this room play golf <clears throat> to get away from our digital devices. Uh, we want to be out there, we want to be just playing the game, we want to enjoy every second of it, we don't want to be interrupted. We really don't want to have to do business, but that's really not relevant to today. And unfortunately, if your club is one that has bans on these things, you're going to struggle to get that female participation as well as the millennials. So a solution to that, uh, an early but non-inexpensive solution, would be in locker rooms like the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport, if any of you have been there. There's an iPad at every single seat that you can go on, you can check your email, you can check your text messages. 
Um, there's carts now that are powered with solar energy, and millennials tend to be very interested in sustainable causes. And golf is really the number one sustainable industry we have, uh, but we don't talk about it. We don't promote it. And as facilities, we don't talk about it in our membership drives. And typically, millennials like that. They want to be a part of something bigger than they are. They want to feel like they're giving back to social causes. So they have digital holders for your phones on carts now that you can have. Um, I should really call them golf cars, I apologize, on golf cars that you have. Um, they have iPad holders. They have chargers that are in those golf cars. If you don't have chargers in your golf cars and people are coming from Manhattan, before they want to hop on that train, they want to plug their phone in. They want to make sure they have time. Do you have outlets within your facility that you don't have to search, like you see the TV ads where people are looking underneath the seats at airports? Do you have charging stations in both locker rooms, not just the men's locker room, but also the women's locker room? Do you have a place where you can go do business and be on a laptop and a phone and be away from the rest of the membership where you're not bothersome to anybody? We all want to play the traditional game. We would like to see it the way it is and remain that way. But really to be relevant to today's current consumer and to really grow your membership amongst the people that the four of us are talking about, um, it's really going to take some change. and It's going to take some change that's out of the box thinking. I mean, if you can go in that direction, you will find people will attend your facility more often, they'll stay longer, and they'll, they'll play more golf. I'd, I'd just like to make one comment about the millennials, especially as it relates to uh, the metropolitan area, because I think we have a unique opportunity, because young professional people that are graduating from college are, you know, are migrating to New York City in unbelievably uh, in great numbers. And many of them obviously coming from, from other parts of the country. Some of them played high school golf, they played college golf, but it seems like they put their golf on hold when they get into that, that age group and then that situation. I think, as, as we've mentioned, they want to join clubs, but it's just not enough of a priority for them. So I think as, as private clubs, we've got to think a little bit out of the box. We've almost got to make it a no-brainer for them to join, create creative ways, uh, membership options for them. Because they're in New York City, they don't know where they're going to live, whether they want to join a club on Long Island, Westchester, or, you know, New Jersey. So they're not going to put down a lot of money up front. They're not going to pay a lot of dues. But if we make it incredibly attractive for them to do it, I think there is this real market there that we can tap into. And that market is just going to continue to grow in, in New York City. And, and Steve, you might want to mention about some of the ways to to create some of these membership opportunities for those younger people. Well, and not only just <coughs> the younger people, Susie pointed out so well, a uh, quick anecdotal story. When I married my wife 37 years ago and we were going up to, the, to get married, she grabbed my arm and she said, you know, I don't know how long we'll be together and how long this will last, but we're probably going to have disagreements, so why don't we get something settled? Okay, and she goes, Steve, why don't you take all the big decisions and I'll take all the little decisions. I said, that's exactly how it's going to be. <laughs> 37 years later, we have yet to have a big decision at my house. <laughs> and when Susie talks about at-risk members, and she talks about, I promise you, men are not quitting private clubs today. Spouses, women of the husbands are saying, we're quitting the club. If you make phone calls to at-risk members, when you call my house, don't ask for me. Ask for my wife. Ask what the club is not providing for her. Ask what the club could do for her and my kids. You make my wife happy and my children happy, I am really happy. Uh, but we're continuing to play to the men when in fact women today are unbelievably powerful and rightfully so uh, and are making so many of the decisions. And we are just not in fact paying close enough attention to their needs and desires assuming that if the man is happy and we're taking care of him that they will remain members. But if you're going to pay attention to anybody, pay attention to women and children, and your clubs will prosper. So Steve's bringing up a pretty good point. Um, the problems we're talking about, um, you were very nice to describe a 52-year-old as middle-aged. So, um, <laughs> but the room is full of aging baby boomers. So we're still leading our clubs. We are in a different spot than we were years ago. Last night at dinner, we talked a little bit about this age group is also thinking about, I have a home in Florida or Arizona, wherever it may be. I've joined another club. Am I going to stay in two clubs or three clubs? What's going to happen or not happen? And yet, we're also trying to run our clubs and make the decisions about what goes on with now, not our children, but going to be our grandchildren, 
our children, the millennials, and so on. So it's a complicated topic on aging baby boomers. And I know, Jay, I think you wanted to start on this topic a little bit. Well, I, I, I'd just like to make a comment. I think when you, you talk about the, the age when people first join or primarily join club, and it's in their 30s and 40s, and, and I think there's great potential, and we talked about in, you know, creating ways for those people to, to really want to join, create incentives. But I, when you look at that curve now, you look at people that are getting into their early 60s, I think there's a real market there of people that have, uh, what are the issues about why I don't join a club or play more golf? It's, it's time and money. And some of those people in their early 60s are now, their kids are out of college, they don't have those tuition fees, and now they have more time that they're, they're not spending with their kids growing up. So I think if clubs look at that as a marketing opportunity to people that are in their early 60s, the aging baby boomers who, for whatever reason, 20 years ago, they just didn't make the call to join a club, I really think there's an opportunity and a market out there that, that we should think about and, tr again, try to find ways to make it uh, attractive for them to participate in our clubs and join our clubs. Susie? And to that, to that end, even some people who are in that age group who have never played golf, uh, I would encourage you to seek them out as well. And I think a, an easy way to do that, there's a couple formats that PGA professional friends of mine have talked to me about, uh, the 30 and 3, 30 minute clinic in 3 holes, 60 and 6, the 60 minute clinic in 6 holes. League play, league play is extremely popular right now amongst junior golf. And if you're not currently doing league play at your facility and you have a strong membership in your junior category, I would highly encourage that. It's, it's two young men or young women that play together. It's a scramble format, so it's not every shot counts, but they could pick theirs or their partner's shot. They play against another twosome, male and female. Um, and you have a little league competition, and it's expanded now into clubs versus clubs. And many of you may already do inner club. But this is really a de developmental way. Maybe your inner club participants are already really strong players at your facilities. But why not offer a developmental league, uh, one where the children are learning uh, the etiquette on the golf course. They're learning how to play quickly. They're playing from a shorter yardage. It's fun. They're making friends. They want to hang out at the golf course more often. Again, this is only for clubs that are really interested in growing that junior program. But to say that you have a junior program because you have a junior camp, or to say that you have baby boomers at your club or you have over 60 opportunities because you have, I don't know, a, a nine hole opportunity on Sunday afternoon at three, in my opinion is really uh, old school thinking. If you can get to the point where a junior program incorporates on course, uh, that's what we're really all here to do is to grow rounds uh, and to grow membership. It's not just to have people at the facility, but people using the facility. And I think if you come up with some neat ways with your PGA professional, um, you'll find that there's a lot of opportunity within that age group over 60 and, and the juniors that you can accomplish. So we've touched on the four topics. I'm going to transition to Jay, but I think we want to open it up to Q&A. Um, we are a little short on time, but I think we're doing okay. And we can clearly touch on any of these topics. I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Good. Thank you, Michael. I hope you make your tea time. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in, in talking about juniors and, and promoting the game, I just want to make one point, and, it, and it's an important point, and I'll try to make it succinctly. Um, you know, I grew up as a caddy. I just How many people in this room started their involvement with golf as caddies? And it, it's a pretty good number, and caddy programs in the Met area are very strong, and they've, they've remained strong. Um, we do a survey where we ask clubs if they have caddy programs. So the number of caddies in season at all of our clubs, it's almost 8,000 caddies. And 10 years ago, I would bet that 60% of those caddies were high school or college kids. And I would bet now that it's 30% are high school or college kids. And it's a subtle change that's happened. I think it's an economic thing. Caddy, caddy fees are one of the, they're going like this. Uh, more people were looking for ways to supplement income with the, with the tough economy. So we've ended up with these, you know, very capable professional caddies, older caddies. And so our, our, the makeup of our caddy cores has changed a lot. And it's, to be honest, in some ways it's easier on the caddy master to deal with these guys that have cars they can make. Uh, they can be there during the week, they can be there in the shoulder seasons. But I'd ask all clubs to, to take a look at that at your club. And if it is happening, 
just take a step back and say, hey, work with your caddy master, your golf program to see, your golf professional. How can we get a place where we make sure we get some young kids and, and change that perc percentage a little bit? And I just think it's something that it's a great feeder system for clubs, and it's, it's something that's changing here in the metropolitan area, and I think it's a small thing that, that we can make a difference there if we really focus on that. And, and I know Bob's a, a former uh, Evans scholar with the Western uh, Golf Association, so I think there's a, just so many great things happening uh, with, with caddy programs, and if we just make sure that we have the spots for the young kids. The last thing that I would leave you with is when you're looking at your messaging around the club and your communication to those whom you're trying to get involved, so whether it's to the females, whether it's to the age over 60, whether it's to junior golfers, keep in mind who you're speaking to and, and use the language that they speak in. So you're really, if you're looking for somebody to sign up, for instance, for a ladies only opportunity at the golf course, um, why not do something a little different instead of having just a flyer? Uh, why not have a video message that shares from another female at your facility that's already participated how wonderful it was and how welcoming it was and how great the experience was. Why not do video messaging to the kids uh, through their parents' emails? Uh, that's how kids take in information now. They're not reading it. Um, they're watching it on YouTube. They're watching it on Facebook. Uh, certainly you wouldn't want to message a child themselves, but through their parents' email or something like that. How neat would that be if you were a junior golfer? And you got a message from the president of the club. I mean, that's pretty incredible and empowering to those people that you want to be at your facility. And if a female, if I were to receive that from a club that I, and it had a literally individualized to me, um, I'd feel like they really wanted me to be a part of this. And I'd almost feel guilty to Steve's point if I didn't participate. And it would make me really want to sign up. And I would think it was innovative and creative. And, and look at my club. Look what we're doing. Uh, not just an email. Um, maybe a phone call, but, but think about the digital ways you can outreach because women are on social media all the time, a lot. Not every female, but a lot are on social media. And are, are you speaking to them in their language? Are you speaking to the juniors uh, in their language? And are you speaking to those over 60 in their language? Uh, yep. Yes? Uh, that's a lot of clubs. Our club has, uh, needs to make a lot of the changes that we discussed today but you have a core group of members that is hanging out for the days of yesteryear. Can you give us any advice in terms of how we can start implementing some of these changes without frankly pissing off and losing the, <laughs> the old the core generation? Is there, I mean, is, there, is there a magic thing that you can say, you know, we, we need the revenue from the core group, but we don't, you know, we know we, know we, need, we, know we need to make these changes to go forward. Well, I, I know Steve, Steve and others can comment on this, but I think uh, we talked about some of these things last night, and so the crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So I think the idea that the club is having, struggling, or, and we need to get you know, to new revenue levels or new membership levels, I think you know, being transparent and talking to your members about that, and I think clearly some of the things that apply to potential new members or more activity from people who aren't using your facility now are not going to appeal to those traditional members who want you know, hard, tough golf course, I want to play 18 holes and I want to concentrate on that. So I, I think one of the things I think is just communicating that for our club to get to where we need to get to, we've got to try to do some of these things. And I'd like to, I think for the traditionalists who maybe say, hey, we don't want that, or that's not golf. I have enough faith in golf that when people get introduced to the game and introduced to our clubs, that they're going to aspire to be golfers and traditional golfers and love all the things that we all love. But I think we have to be open to, to getting them engaged and getting them involved in the game. And if that, that takes some things that are not traditional and a little out of the box, I think we've got to be open to it. And, and certainly others might want to comment on that question because it is a tough one. I think you've got to involve them. But I also think you, you involve younger members or the members that um, are are going in the direction that you want to go. But I think we underestimate uh, how stuck we are, you know, in, in tradition, uh, because just green speeds, uh, bunkering, just um, playing, always playing stroke play, even when we're playing match play, the handicap system says, well, we should play stroke play. You know, so when 
when we experiment with a Ryder Cup and people get to play alternate shot and they get to play scram, they love it. So I say experiment, you know. The, the younger, the, the millennials coming up are great sports fans, really great sports fans. They are totally into all sports. Can you create events around other, you know, around the World Series, around the, um, um, the Masters, whatever? The, the point is, uh, it's not going to be the same for everybody. It's like that scramble at, at Brooklawn where it, it was organic. The members came up with that idea. It only became a kind of official event much later. So, um, but it starts with you got to involve them. You got to tell them, hey, we need your help. Yes, Bob. We talk about adding uh, younger associates, and the struggle I find in, 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 our, in our club is, yes, we have to get younger, but they can't vote. <laughs> you know, we set, we set a, um, a fee structure, uh, whether it be for you know, a senior house or a house or a young person, but then you don't have any rights in the, in the club. Or we'll say, we're a country club, but let's not build these other amenities because we really just have to focus on the golf course. And in, in, in my tenure, I've, that's the biggest struggles, that, one of the struggles I've had is how do I bridge that gap and, and what are people seeing? If I have someone coming in and that is your due structure and you're a full active associate member, it's ancient to think that you don't have a say as to who runs for the board or that you can't be on the board. And then we, we constantly come in, okay, but now go over there, come back when you're a grown up. It just doesn't make any sense and I wonder how other clubs might be handling that. Yeah. You make a, <clears throat> a wonderful point. The vast majority of votes that are being made at private clubs are being voted on by people about people who will never be at the club. Uh, and in my judgment, young executive associates from you know, 30 to 40 should have a vote. Perhaps it's weighted, perhaps it's half a vote, but clearly they need to have a voice. And when they feel, feel alienated uh, and people who are making decisions about their future at the club and they have no voice uh, is, ve is very detrimental. And, and spouses. Uh, you know, I, I keep telling my anecdotal stories, but my wife and I, we own everything together. It's just ridiculous that if I would be out of town traveling and there would be a vote at the club, that my wife shouldn't have the privilege to go up and exercise our vote. But many clubs say, oh, well, if Steve's not here, you know, you just can't vote. Uh, it's the 21st century, and we need, to speak. We, we need to be honoring the past, and we need to be giving respect to it, but looking forward to a future. And it's a public relations game. You know, Susie may get mad at me, but oftentimes, it's, you know, it's like it's telling a woman they can't play golf, and I'm a former golf professional, they can't play golf on Saturday morning. Many times they don't want to play golf on Saturday morning. They don't want to be told they can't play golf on Saturday morning. There are certain rooms that they're told they can't go into. They don't want to go into those rooms, but they don't want to be told they can't go into those rooms. And seniors don't want to be told that their history at the club is being disrespected. So it's, it's a public relations game of, of honoring them, but then in fact, and, and, and the past, but building towards the future and, and looking at what is going to, and those, in my judgment, I agree with you, those people should have some vote and weight in those decisions. Okay. Hey, we're, we're uh, keeping everyone for golf, and, and maybe just in closing, I'll just make a couple of general comments. Uh, one, and, and it struck me listening to the presentations from the audience, just like you have, that I think the most important thing for clubs is to is to know your club, know your unique culture, know your strengths and weaknesses. And certainly a lot of the ideas that were thrown out today will work at some clubs, they won't, won't work at others. But this idea of creating, focusing on your mission, your statement, your core values, I think it really is important. And just to generalize, and I think heard a lot of themes today, I think as I look at, at golf in the future and clubs in the metropolitan area, uh, I think the, the trend of people playing less golf is certainly not going to go away quickly. I think the models that we're going to look at in the future are going to have uh, more members in, in, in the model clubs of the future. Um, I think that uh, value is going to be incredibly important, and if we're not delivering great value, um, we're not going to be able to compete for discretionary income and for time and those things. And when I say value, it's not just cost, because I think there's plenty of people in the metropolitan area that can afford private clubs, can afford reasonable dues structures.
but they have other options for their time and money. And if we're not delivering great value, we're just not going to be high enough on that priority list. So I think that those are things that we should also all work at uh, constantly. So I think, and again, as I said before, though, we should, uh, you know, really recognize and appreciate uh, the great game that we have, the great facilities, the great clubs that we have, and, and never shortchange that. I think we all, every opportunity when we hear uh, the negative press about golf and the games and about private clubs, we've got to stand up and speak. Uh, and I think uh, that perception that's out there is a deterrent from new people trying the game and some of those stereotypes that are out there, we all have to work to break those down. So on our so my soapbox there for a little bit, but uh, thanks everyone for their attention today.